Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled, professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started today, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for the missing piece of the puzzle to grow your business? Well, I want to invite you to watch my free online training on how I went from hobbyist to celebrity wedding planner and how you can do it too. You will discover the puzzle pieces that will absolutely transform your business from hobbyists to like, hell yeah, I can do this full time. On puzzle piece one, I'm going to go all into personality. Puzzle piece two, how to keep the high quality clients happy. Puzzle piece three, I'm going to talk about what separates the good from the great. On four best kept secrets to profitability and all about implementing the strategies. And five, if you're going to attract the best, come on, people, you got to be the best. And then I'm going to show you how to create the magic and put it all together for you and your clients. So don't wait another minute. Go on over to go.angelaprofit.com. That's G O dot Angela Profit, two F's and two T's dot com and watch my free videos and download my free workbooks that will take your business to the next level. Hi y'all, it's Angela Profit. I'm back again for another episode of Weddings Unveiled and today I am interviewing somebody that I've known for a really, really long time. Jim McCarthy is an awesome entrepreneur, media coach, content creator, marketing guru. He's done lots of different things. One of the things he's focusing on now, which I absolutely love, is helping people doing podcast. I remember when I first got started years ago and how nerve wracking it was. And now it's like, you know, I just roll out of bed and it's something I do all the time is just jump on and do podcasts. So I'm excited for you guys to hear Jim's story. And hey, Jim, how are you? Doing very well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm so glad that we reconnected. Um, Our audience who they don't know who you are yet, but they will know who you are. Um, Share a little bit about your background and where'd you get started being an entrepreneur? I, uh, it all started when I was a small boy. (laughs) um, (laughs) My father was an entrepreneur. Uh, He was one of those guys who liked to buck the trend um, and live life on his own terms and give us a childhood that really was exceptional uh, compared to what we could see growing up in school. Uh, we were, we had a great childhood. We had a lot of good memories. He was all about that, but also living life on his terms. And that, I think a lot of that DNA was instilled in me from a very early age. Um, but then, you know, they, they want me to follow the, the traditional paths because they never went to college. So by proxy, that's what everybody did back then, quote unquote, is go to college, get your degree, get a quote, good job, uh, security and all that stuff. But he also said, well, if you want to get things in life, you have to learn how to sell, learn how to kind of think entrepreneurially, but at the same time, hey, have something to fall back on. You know, we want, I wanted to be a drummer in a band, but that's all, that's all well and good, Jim, but have something to fall back on, you know, Uh, have a plan to fail in a way. Not that I blame them for that, but it was, it it was their generational thinking back then. And for good reason, you know, they grew up in a post-depression era. Mm -hmm. Uh, I grew up in you know, the 70s, well, the 80s and 90s. Um, and I tell this story all the time on my podcast. Uh, the realities of entrepreneurship are when the economy gets real and you got to make really tough sacrifices. And we brought our business that he had built through the 80s into our house um, in uh, Danbury, Connecticut from Elmsford, New York. And we're oddly enough, because I own a lighting company as well, an electrical company. <clears throat> I was putting Back up a then? Light- no, well, not, not back then, but no, now. Oh. 
Uh, oh my, my father's boy. business was telecommunications. So it was gotcha. like I, I was I was in the trades early on. I knew how to run cable and how to cut it down and the color code and stuff like that. So we were putting up a light fixture in our basement <clears throat> where we were moving on our, our office. And I was maybe 15 or 16 years old, formative years, you know. And uh, I was up on a ladder doing the thing, wiring it up. And um, I said, hey, why don't we get a pizza? And this is the, uh, the world famous pizza story I tell. And I can't I wait to hear it. Down at my dad. <clears throat> and he goes, I said, let's, let's get a pizza. And he goes, well, we can. Oh, okay. Why not? Um, well, we can't afford it. And oh. I was thinking to myself at you know, 15 years old, I'm going, wow. Okay. This is, that's when I knew it was like you know, the recession that we were going through at that time was, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was as real as it got. That's the, and it kind of hit me. And it's one of those things that I remembered back at that particular point in my life that I would remember it for the rest of my life. Yeah. So that's something that stayed with me. Um, I, I learned early on to not, you know, that, that kind of grew from there where <clears throat> to stay somewhat true to yourself. I, 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 did, I didn't not enjoy working with him, um, but it's a family business. He was kind of getting out of it and wasn't really in love with it as, as much as he used to be and wanted to get into retirement and stuff. So I ended up becoming an electrician at some point. Um, I, I was good at it by nature because I was always good by, with my hands, but I just didn't like it. You know, yeah. and I had a, uh, I always, I always felt like I was meant for something other than that. So every morning I woke up to go to this electrician job, which I'm not bagging on electrician jobs at all. I mean, by all means, I own a company that does that now. Um, we, need <clears throat> they, them. we need them bad. <laughs> right. We need a, the trades need to be reinvigorated right now. Absolutely. But at the time I hated getting out of bed. Yeah. You know, I was 20, 21 years old at that time. And I remember that feeling of why do I have to get up and do this again? Because my college didn't work out. It just wasn't for me. I was self-aware and know enough to know that I need to figure something else out. So I went to broadcasting school, <clears throat> went to Connecticut School of Broadcasting, and uh, graduated, quote unquote. I learned how to cut and splice tape, which ended me getting into a radio station in Connecticut. Oddly enough, the radio station I grew up listening to that I swore I'd never work for is the one that I cut my teeth at. <clears throat> bom, bom. <laughs> yeah. But you know, hey, it, everything happens okay. for a reason. It was one hundred percent. It was all. Mm -hmm. It was all good memories, uh, a lot of good experiences, and um, I didn't have any entrepreneurial leanings. It was more cutting my teeth, getting a foundation of my craft, getting better, uh, voicing more, producing more. I was on air. Uh, wasn't really big. On, I thought I'd want to be on air, but when I was on air, it was boring as hell. I didn't like it. Uh, <clears throat> so. I came to a point where I wanted to, it, it was time to move on. In radio, you have to move around the country. If you want to get better, grow, if you want to make more money, you move around the country. So, really? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Broadcasting is like that. One of the guys that I remember in broadcasting school, they even said, if you're not willing to move around in, this, in the country or move around a lot in this business, you might as well find something else to do. And it was, that wow. hit me hard. This dude was talking real stuff. Uh, so I ended up, uh, getting an opportunity, oddly enough with the guy I just had him on my podcast last night, my first program director in Vegas <clears throat> who hired me for a talk radio gig. So my wife to be and I, uh, moved out to Vegas. First time we'd ever been there. The big adventure had a great time. Oh Spent my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I went from being a big fish in a really small pond in Connecticut and being the man to being a very tiny sardine. Uh -huh. In an ocean. And how does that feel? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Talk about inadequate. Uh-huh. You know, I tell the story about uh, the first week we were there, we were moving into, and both my wife and I, we had never been west of the Mississippi. So oh my God. I went to go, I said, well, let, let me bring you a pizza for lunch because I knew she was unpacking boxes. I was at work getting used to my new environment. <clears throat> so I ran across the st street to this California pizza place. Uh-huh. And... While I was waiting for my $25 eight inch pizza. <laughs> of course, but they're damn good. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at the menu and on the back of the menu, it has a listing of all their locations and they were mm -hmm. all in California, Nevada, and Arizona. And I was mm -hmm. thinking to myself, holy crap, am I far, I'm a long way from home. That's wow. when it really hit me. Wow. You I have know. a lot of, like, I am, I am an, 
memorable things with pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No you kidding. do. <laughs> Go figure. Have you seen me? Crying out loud. Uh, <clears throat> so we ended up, um, you know, I, I, we, we, we spent four years there. Mm -hmm. I ended up becoming a pretty big influential uh, person in the building and in the industry and very well known in that time. So it proved to me a lot of different things, including that when you get uncomfortable, it's one of the best things you can do. You know, a lobster only grows when it outgrows its shell. And Amen. in order to do that, it has to get uncomfortable. You got to do things that other people wouldn't consider conventional. It also gave us perspective because I always thought I wanted to be Howard Stern's production guy growing up, you know, oh, when God. I got on the radio. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, we moved out to Vegas and we could actually afford a house and have a life and do all this stuff. And I looked back at the Northeast thing. I never want to live there again. Yeah. So <clears throat> fast forward. And also at that time, the guy who had my job, and this is where my entrepreneurial DNA started kicking in. I guess this is where I started my side hustle. Um, he said, uh, you know, I'm really tired. He says, I, I started my side business doing voiceover because I got tired of seeing the salespeople drive all the nice cars. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. And I said, you know, I never thought about it that way. I said, you mean I should probably consider, he says, by all means, you should do your own voiceover business. So I started a company called cnotespots.com and I had a whole slew of voiceover talent, myself included, that I did $100 production, <clears throat> C-Note, and uh, did that for a while. It, it was successful, but it morphed. I didn't believe in my own voice at that particular time to carry the business. So I had other people there in, in the uh, stable of talent to help the business grow. <clears throat> but I've always was employed by radio up until about 2013. We moved to Nashville in 05. I worked for Mix 92.9 and Jack FM, uh, where coincidentally I met you. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. A long time ago. And, uh, uh you came in there and I was like, you know, you were all on that path. And I remember thinking, that's kind of cool to have the balls at chutzpah to get out there and just do your thing, you know? Yep. And I want to say it was probably around the economic downturn. Uh-huh. It was a tough time, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> so but it was a needed into, thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, radio kind of played itself out. I was eight and a half years into being with those radio stations, still having a side hustle. I got into video production, but I didn't really do all the things needed to really build it into a full-time thing. I just didn't have the confidence, I guess you, you could say. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I ended up getting into uh, the car business of all things. There was a little bit of a detour before I got out of radio. I got into the collision business because somebody had, had discovered me in the radio station and all the different things that I could do. He said, I've been looking for somebody like you for years, oh. who produce video, who could do voiceover, uh, you know, buy and sell advertising, uh, do online social media, you know, an in-house agency person that he could have in his business. And it was big enough to accommodate it. But <clears throat> little did I know he was one of the most fire happy people that were, I've ever met. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So I made a really good salary for about three months. <clears throat> I came in one day beyond circumstances beyond my control. Hey, we're letting you go. It's not oh because God. of you. I just don't, I just don't believe in what we're doing. It was just that wonky. Wow. So I guess my first element of sales really kind of kicked in at that point where I knew I was a good salesperson, but I didn't understand the selling process. And you now that point in sales where you get that to the point where you have nothing really left to lose and you start asking all the really good questions. <laughs> That's awesome. He, I started fighting for my job. I said, well, is it the price? And little did I know I was removing objections mm -hmm. at that point. He says, well, you know, it's just, it's just, it's not working out. I said, well, am I too expensive? What's the problem? Right. We could, you know, figure this, figure this out. Do I need to back down on how much you're paying me? Cause look at what, what all you're getting with what you're paying me. <clears throat> and uh, it still didn't, you know, Hey, I called my buddy who was going to hire me in the car business and said, Hey, tail between the legs. We used to have me. He said, yeah, come on got into the car business. That's where I truly, I think, although at entrepreneurial DNA, the most important thing about being in work is you also have to be a salesperson. Mm -hmm. The car business is one of the best schools I've ever attended. I swear to it this day to, to probably my dying day, that it was one of the best educations I've ever received because in car I thought school? I knew. 
car business. Car business. Oh, business. being in the car <clears throat> business. Gotcha. Yep. And that really enabled me to uh, learn how to sell. I was just on a podcast earlier. Uh, and I said, you know, a lot of people talk about serving waiting tables mm -hmm. and everybody at some point in their life should wait tables, which I agree with because it helps you deal with people. Um, yeah. I will even extend that and say, I think everybody should at least sell cars for six months. Uh, <laughs> it'll teach you how to sell. It'll teach you not only how to sell <clears throat> and apply a fundamental sales process, but how to close. That's the important thing. So. What's that your top is, tip though? Like if somebody was like, what do you mean, Jim? Like <laughs> close. I mean, close. I mean, hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, you know what close means, but yeah. like what's your, do you have like a top, like one top tip that you tell people? Every meeting you have, you know, especially since this is a podcast for creatives, a lot of what I do is I speak to creatives of all types on how to sell. And that's one of the things I've developed over the years very loosely. I don't really pursue it. But if, I'm, if I get invited to speak somewhere, it's typically on that uh, topic for creative people, photographers, graphic designers, videographers, voiceover people. Um, when it comes to closing, every little meeting you have, the one tip to take away, I guess at this point you could say, is get a mini commitment of some, some type with every interaction. You know, get a too many people go into it and a, a, a commitment, a mini commitment. What are we doing next? Yep. How do we keep this conversation going? And what are we doing next? When are we getting together next? What are we going to go over? You know, if they're not ready to close on the deal right then and there, okay, then what are we doing next? What's the next step? What do you want to do? Well, I need to look this over and get together with my superiors and bring it up to somebody else. Great. When can we, when can we connect and go over even better? Help me close your project and you give them ownership because now you're talking about their project and use that language uh, to get in front of that person that's going to make that decision. I want to be able to help you and look, make you look like a rock star. How do we make that happen? So you, you know, said something asking, really important just now about their language, like mm -hmm. mirroring. And that's really important, like from a psychology angle about the takeaway is mirror what they're saying and learn how to use their language. So that's key, really, really key to closing. Closing is just, you know, asking, how do we make this happen? You know, if you get the ball to the 10 yard, five yard line, how do you get it across the goal line? And I think a lot of voiceover people, especially fail at this all the time. They just don't know how to be assertive and figure out you know, in the value proposition stage, putting on, putting the blinders on. So they don't talk to anybody else. They're not going to shop around. Look, I meet your parameters. We're going to figure out where we fit budget wise. What's next? What do we need to do to continue as well? When do we get your project done? You know, when do we book the video shoot? When do we book the, you know, the, the, the photo shoot? Um, yep. <clears throat> and, and not, and finding your own voice in that, not being so blatantly aggressive like that. Eventually, it's applying the fundamentals until you find your voice, which is what I learned in the car business. And I got really good at it. It was uncomfortable at first, very uncomfortable. For me to ask somebody to buy the car was unbelievably <laughs> uncomfortable. Okay, Because it was like, oh my, I feel like such a skeevy car salesman. But at the same time, you start realizing, well, this is how I feed my family. I yeah. need to make sure that what I show that I leave in my product offering them is indeed valuable. How do we go ahead and make this happen? And finding my own voice in that where I was comfortable to do that. And it worked every time after a while. I found my own rhythm. I just, I don't know where, it's like, I don't know where this whole formula of like sleazy car sales, I don't know where that, I don't know if a movie came out and like that's what started this whole thing. But like, I think, did I buy a car from you? I think, did I? Or did I see you we when shot. I was shopping for a car? <clears throat> no, I believe you were on, I was Facebook and marketing myself at, on Facebook. I went from Honda to Mercedes-Benz, which I love to this day. I still love that brand. Uh, loved selling it. I loved driving them. It spoiled me for luxury vehicles forever. Um, 
So you, I think you had reached out to me via Facebook and said that That's you were interested. Right. In That's so, right. So, well, no, and you, even, didn't, you didn't buy a car for me. Okay. So to even to back up, I, um, <laughs> when I went into the radio station, which mm-hmm. this is all pre me being coached and me hiring someone like such as yourself, like teaching me how to do these things. And so I went in to do like a 30 second slot for one of our favorite caters in Nashville chef's market. And Jim's like, can you, you have a great voice? Like, can you come in? And you know, he, I think he picked like multiple planners to come in and I'm like 30 seconds. Like that's not very much time. Like what the hell can I say in 30 seconds? And so I went in and, but you were so good at it. Like, that's the thing. You were so good at it. And I met you and I'm like, God, you have such a great voice. And you told, you're like, Oh, I do voiceovers and blah, blah, blah. And this is right when video started to take a turn in technology where I started to learn about audio engineering in video and it became videographers into cinematographers. And I had clients that really started paying 10,000 and upwards for these video productions when we were getting into the recession, like you said, but in the wedding and the funeral business, people were still in love. They're still getting married and people are still going to die and they're going to have celebration of lives or funerals. So all of my friends that got laid off in the medical industry were like, can we just come work with you? Which I lost all my friends that way. So don't do that. Um, They just running a business (laughs) and then like actually being your friend is like two different things when you're not on the same page. Um, I'm like, this isn't really a luxury thing. Like you, we take care of people and you have to have a passion for it. And so I went in and I had my little script and I'd practiced it. And then I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And you're like, oh, we're done. I'm like, what do you mean you're done? We haven't even like recorded. And you're like, oh, I've already recorded you. You're done. And I'm like, oh my God, you effing tricked me. Like, I'm like, did I cuss? What did I just say? I'm like, shit. We'll bleep it up. Do you remember that? Because like- oh, yeah. I grew up around, my dad was in law enforcement, our brother, I mean, I just, I grew up around a bunch of men that like say cuss words all the time. My mom hates it, but it's just, you know, it's a fact of our language. And, you know, I just freely talk and then I'm like, oh my God, edit out any cuss words. And like the owner of Chef's Market, who's like so ultra Christian, and which I mean, I'm a Christian and you know, all that, but he's just like, he has a great voice too. And I'm like kind of a loud and obnoxious and, you know, he's like, so like proper and quiet and I'm like okay well if I'm done uh and then I'm like can I listen to it before you put it on the radio because I'm not I don't remember what I just said and so um but that taught me something is that you never know who's recording you (laughs) so anything you say (laughs) you better damn well mean it and be okay with it showing up on the front page Facebook um that's the conversation we have now with my sister's kids of like, okay, um, nude pictures and Snapchat. You, you don't want to wake up and like see anything that your grandmother and grandfather would want to see on Facebook because they're all on Facebook now. So it's just so mm-hmm. funny. Like now the older I am. Yeah. And then I remember I, you popped up somewhere in my feed and I'm like, oh, he's selling cars. And I don't even know if you remember what happened, but I was at Alexis for eight years and drove the wheels off of it and it caught on fire when I was driving it. Um, I thought I needed an oil change. The service light check engine thing was on and it was about that time. And I was taking my car to my parents. They were going to take me to the airport. I was flying somewhere to do some event. And I'm like on the phone with a Brad and a florist and, you know, on my Bluetooth. And all of a sudden I'm like driving with my dogs in my lap and flames. I'm getting off the interstate like two seconds from my parents' house and flames start coming out of my engine. And I'm like, um, I'm having a little bit of car trouble. Like I'm going to have to call you back. And so like pull over, throw it into drive, turn the car off, grab my computer case because it's of course in the front seat with me and my dogs. And I run like as far as fast as I can away from my car. This is like during the day. No one stopped. Like people just kept getting off the interstate. I'm like, wow, wow. So I call my parents. I'm like, oh, my car just caught on fire. So and my dad comes up there with a fire extinguisher. (laughs) And so, you know, they have the car towed. I go to the airport and all that. And then I pay three grand to get it fixed. There was a leak, like a radiator or something. I fly home, pick it up, have a meeting all day. My car's in valet at the Hutton. I come out of the hotel and the guy's like, ma'am, um, your steering wheel, like it won't turn. 
so I'm like, is this an effing joke? Like I just paid three grand to get my car out of the shop at five 30 this morning. I'm, I'm confused. And he's like, no, I'm not kidding. Um, so we can like push your car across the street because there was like a little body shop, which now it's torn down and it's like a bank or something. And like the valet people were so nice. And so they filled my car up with, um, the power steering fluid. And all of a sudden it like completely, it's like my car was peeing. <laughs> and he's like, uh, you have a hole and all of the um, power steering fluid just came out of the front. And so he's like, you can't drive your car. I'm like, is this some kind of a joke? So the guy that fixed it towed the car. And so he's like, honey, if you were my wife, I would just buy you a new car because like this car has too many miles on it. Just get rid of it. And he's like, I'll patch it up, you know, and then you, you just need to get rid of it and get a new car. And I was not in the mind frame of getting a car. Like I didn't have a car payment. I didn't want to buy a car. You know, I was fine with my car. And, um, so then I'm like, shit, I guess I need to like buy a car. And I drove a rental car for like a month because I didn't have time to like go and drive cars. And I think I did come to the dealership and see you. Um, mm -hmm. and I thought I would just like go get another Lexus and I did drive the SUV Mercedes cause I needed an SUV. And then I went over to, I, I think I went to like six or seven dealerships and probably drove 50 or 60 cars in one day. And then by right. the end of the day, I'm like, nah, I really, 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 really like this one car. I'm ne I've never been a car person ever. And, um, but you know, my dad said never buy a brand new car. What is your feeling on that, by the way? Uh, when it comes to the Highline luxury cars, um, you it's lease okay. them. Oh, you lease, lease them. them. Oh, really? Okay. Well, then you're going to think I'm a dumbass when I tell you this. So my High dad, cars. Yeah. well, so I was at the Porsche dealership and um, it was the first year of this brand new Macan or however you say it. And so it was my favorite car that I drove that day, but it was brand new. It was the first year they'd released it. And I called my dad and I'm like, dad, I know you said never buy a new car. You know, it's like, I'm still the kid of approval, you know, even mm -hmm. though I'm like <laughs> well into my age of making my own decisions. And um, I didn't even finish my sentence and he's like, honey, you work your ass off. You, this is an investment and you drive clients around. If you want the car, just buy it. Yeah. And so I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And so I got off the phone and I'm like, oh my God. So, you know, okay. So, and the guy's like, well, you can sit down and custom order it. And then it'll be about three to four weeks. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like I have no car. <laughs> like it caught on fire <laughs> and I've been mm -hmm. driving a rental car. So I need like, can I not just buy this car? And he's like, I, it's our floor model. Like I'll have to call our manager. You know, he had to go through all these hoops. I'm like, I need to drive the car off like today, like right now. Like I'm not, it's black. It's fine. I don't need to custom anything. Like it's fine. And so, you know, he got all the, and then I just ended up paying and driving the car. But my friends who live in LA, when they came home for Christmas, they're like, oh my God, you got a fast car. And um, her and her husband had a bet. And he's from LA. She's from Nashville. And um, he's like, Ange leased that car. And Monica, my best friend, she's like, no, Ange bought that car. <laughs> you yeah. don't know her. And so they had this little bet. And so later that night, you know, after they had a few drinks and they're like, we're not trying to get into your business, but like, did you buy or lease that car? And I'm like, oh, I'll, you know, if anybody asks me, I don't care. I'm like, I just bought it outright. And Monica's like, I told you, I told you. And Eric's like, oh my God, no one in LA would ever buy that. You lease those cars, Angela, you're an idiot. But I guess why is that? Because I don't know. I mean, I've had it for several years and I love it. But the, why you, I, I made it a pro when I when I became first full time entrepreneur, like you know, full time into it several years ago. What I I made a, started making a practice, and my my podcast is all about marinating your mind in good stuff. If you want your life to be good and and have good things and and good things to happen, marinate your mind in good stuff. Get around good people. So that's exactly what I started doing back when I became fully self employed. Was okay. What do the rich people do? And let's do that. So you start listening to some of their ways of reasoning and you got different schools of thought, but this one particular gentleman, uh, Grant Cardone. Uh-huh. I know Grant. You know Grant. <laughs> he's awesome. <clears throat> he's hilarious. Yeah. He, uh, 
he talked in, and it's funny because he was in the car business. He he was a huge sales trainer for the car business. The majority of his professional life was dealt in the car business. And yep. um, when you use other people, low, low interest loans or leases, and are more of your own for other things that create cash flow. It's oh. much better. That's why a lease is better because you're paying less for the, you're only paying for the depreciated portion of the car. And typically the dealerships like where you bought from and where I worked, they started 10 to 15% automatically knocked off the car from MSRP. So you already had a leg up. Gotcha. Uh, so from, and you residualized the mileage and a lease on a car like that, <clears throat> you know, typically when you buy a car like that, it costs you about 85 to 90 cents per mile to own the car. Okay. With a lease, you know what you're paying. You know what you're paying per mile. And a lot of people, oh my gosh, 20 cents per mile. Well, compared to paying 85 cents per mile, uh -huh. 20 cents is a deal. Okay. <laughs> so no one so, has and those ever the, said it like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, wow. and, and that's, that's a lot of what I learned in the car business. And it made a lot of sense because um, you're only in control of two things when you drive a vehicle. It's the condition you keep it in and the miles you drive. The other things you have no control over. You, don't, you can't control if somebody hits you. You can't control other drivers, things of that nature. You can't control how much gas you, well, I guess you can. But I mean, the cost of ownership or, you know, ownership, uh, I'm, I'm making air quotes, <laughs> and a lease on a car like that just makes sense, more sense on a lease. And it's funny because when I, I actually met, we did a podcast for a buddy of mine. I produce podcasts and we flew down to Miami to Cardone's place to interview him. And yeah. we talked about leasing cars and I'm like, oh yeah, one pay lease. And Grant, he's like, yeah, one pay lease is you don't do that either. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. He says, well, think about it. You're putting all that money out and that one fell swoop when you could be using it to put up in other places to make you money. You know, money should be looked at as a tool. Okay. You know? and Interesting. That's, yeah. That's why, you know, a lot of the rich people just lease their cars, even though the Ram Dave Ramsey people of the world think, well, that's stupid. Your mortgage, it's a depreciating asset no matter, it's not even an asset. It doesn't make you any money. It's a right. depreciating estimate, which way you look at it, you know? Right. Well, well I want to own my car. Yeah. You, okay. You, you, you're, the bank is financing it. Do you have the pink slip? Well, no, then you don't own it. Try, try yeah. missing a couple of payments and see who owns the car. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because some of the, um, you know, it's especially like some of the people that are on Grant's show that I've spoken with on at tech conferences and these social media conferences. It's funny because a lot of them, they actually talk about car stories and how like they mm -hmm. were so house poor and like pouring everything else, but they have like two amazing expensive suits and a really nice car because it would make them money that way. Yeah. And I mean, I get it because it's like, I mean, I, and, and I, I grew up like with the Dave Ramsey parents and I love Dave. Like I've done some stuff with him and a long time ago when one of his daughters got married, but like it is, um, it, it's two different ways of thinking. It, I mean, it's yes. not even gray. It's like black and white. It's like, and he's very much an entrepreneur. But he's an entrepreneur and what led him into where he is today is because he has helped a lot of people get out of debt. But being an entrepreneur and also, like you said, surrounding yourself with smart people who are not like you, which if I didn't have those people in my, my life, like business manager, accountant, things like that, like I would be bankrupt because mm -hmm. I would not really pay attention. Um, but it's interesting. I have one more question. I mean, this is like, I hope that you guys, if you're in the... Uh, if you're looking for a new car, this helps you. Um, so I keep getting these, you know, my car's two years old. So I keep getting these things from Porsche and they're like, Hey, bring your car in and you know, get a brand new one. And I love their sales tactic. Like when you get an oil change or any, a deer hit my car recently and like, you know, they took care of it all. Great customer service, all that, but they put you in a brand new car so mm -hmm. that you could drive it for a few days, which I know is totally a great sales tactic. I mean, and they're like, Oh, come trade your car and lease it out. Like what's the value of that? I guess is to just keep the new ones turning and keep them on the road. Like, is that a good idea? Now you got me thinking, I'm going to, I'm like, Oh, should I just go like trade my car and go get a, a brand new that's, one and lease it? I don't know. <laughs> that's the, the car business version of tapping into residual income. So that's another, I mean, leases are good for all parties involved because after two to three years, you're going to need a new car. 
they want to try and get you back and get you into another one and, 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 and entice you into another one with, you know, uh, what they call pulling your lease soon. So six months to the end of your lease, they'll reach out to you and say, uh, you know, hey, if you bring it in now, we could use your car for a certified pre-owned model and we could sell it on the, the used lot and we'll get you in for maybe a couple dollars more a month on something that's got a fresh warranty, fresh mileage, all the latest gadgets and bells and whistles. Well, this is uh, less. They're like mm-hmm. for $200. And I'm like, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, how, do, how does that even work? It like, could be a lot of different mitigating circumstances. My, my, you know, I helped a friend of mine. Uh, he treated himself to a car. He ended up, he leased it. And it's funny because yeah, every time he's like, oh my gosh, this car's costing me so much and it's all your fault. And I'm going, <laughs> You, I, I helped you. I, I, I didn't tell you to do anything. Okay. I, I led you down the path, the proper way to do it, getting a trade appraisal on your car and then bringing it over to them. And, you know, we went to the Porsche dealership and they were a little bit out of his range, but we went up the hill to Audi and yep. like the briefcase and Pulp Fiction, when it opened, it was like the light coming out. He just like white on race, just glommed onto this, uh, what was it? A, yeah, an Audi, one of the sportier ones, two seater, uh, TT. <clears throat> so makes perfect sense for him. And it was his first big, you know, like nice car treat himself purchase yeah. that he deserved after so much, you know, 20 some odd years of grinding it out in Nashville and having success. So I helped him buy the car. Uh, but because he had an upside down trade, he had to take care of that, that inequity in the lease. And so his payment was higher, but so that could be a mitigate. It, it's just so many, so many variables that go into those deals. You just don't know. Uh, it's, you know, it could be a credit thing. Who knows? It could be money down, you know, that, I don't know. It, it, a lot of them put it out there with the payment. And then, you know, once you get to the table, they don't tell you, this is, oh, by the way, it's actually this payment with $5,000 down. It, you know, that stuff. I never did that. I didn't like doing that. So I was always upfront, um, you know, told people exactly what they needed to hear. There were no surprises when it came time to close. Uh, I did not like doing business otherwise. You know, gotcha. that's just me though. That's, that's why I, I had a good cust- I had a good book of business. That's awesome. <clears throat> right. Well, and then you, I guess, got out of that industry. And then, um, yeah. you know, I know that I think when we talked at one time, you're like, so what's your end goal? What's your end game? I'm like, I'm going to buy an island. And then we <laughs> like reconnect on Facebook and you're like, hey, podcasting. And I'm like, hey, contact Amanda. She like is awesome. And she, I just get on and talk. And then she like, you know, books people and they take care of the editing and all that. It's great. Um, and then and then here we are. So, but like from a creative standpoint, so guys, I'm like, so what are you doing now, Jim? And he's like, well, I'm still doing voiceovers. Obviously you have an amazing voice. And, um, I think I've reached out to you before. Like we have a few diva bands that we work with every once in a while and they don't have a great lead MC. And I always think of you, there's these two bands and I'm like, okay, if these people hire these, these bands, like we're going to have to hire like a real MC because these bands suck. They think it's about them when it's not like it's this luxury wedding. It's about the couple. And so, um, and a really bad MC with a band can absolutely ruin and make it very awkward if you don't have somebody on the mic that a knows what they're doing and b they don't have like a good powerful voice where people actually pay attention and it's Mm -hmm. getting worse and worse in our industry because these people are so I don't even know what the right word for it is other than rude. And so if people like I will tell like dads and people that are going to make speeches, I'm like, listen, you tell the people may have your attention, please. And you stand up there and you say it five or six or seven, eight, nine, ten times until people are effing quiet. And I walk around like a kindergarten teacher, like going, shh. So people will shut up and listen. It's like, oh my God, these parents have paid all this money investing in this party for their kids and you can't be quiet for five minutes. Like it just, obviously it pisses me off. It's just rude. Um, (laughs) but getting back to the whole like creative industry thing, which again, Mm -hmm. it's like your background and like where you've led up to this and doing when when you were like, yeah, led lights, I was 15. I'm like, how long have led lights been out? Like they haven't been out that long, you know, with, and there's so many cool things that, can be done now. But aside from the whole like voiceover thing and podcast and coaching, you mentioned that like, 
So tell mm-hmm. us about that and how what's that going down with like that. Yeah, how'd that start? <laughs> <laughs> My business partner that I have, uh, it's big.lighting.com, and we do LED conversions for commercial spaces, warehouses. We just finished Trevecca University, uh, upgrading every single bulb on the campus to LED. Um, and that came about when I was in the car business. A lot of us guys, after selling these high-end cars and not making much money, and it was more of a volume game, getting as many cars out as possible, not really too much of a customer service game. Um like it should be in that kind of a brand, but I digress. A lot of us would talk, okay, we're, we know we're good at we, what we do. What is lucrative? What else could we possibly be selling that will, you know, pay a good dividend every time you make a sale? So my wife was running a 5K at the time, uh, and my business partner, who I have now, he and I always knew each other through networking groups like BNI. Um, and mm-hmm. he was there on, I, I had no idea that he was at the 5k. My, my wife and his wife were off running the 5k and we were left behind with the kids and I see him and I'm like, Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? You know, how's Renova, which is the company I knew him with that he owned. It was a facility maintenance company. And, um, he says, I'm doing great. You know, I said, but what do you, how's Renova? And he goes, I sold that part of the company. I'm not doing that anymore. I said, oh, really? Well, what, what do you know? He says, I'm doing LED lighting. And oh. as soon as he said it, Angela, a little voice in my head said, you can sell that and you can market that. It was like instantaneous. <laughs> like there was something all, it was like, that's interesting. Tell me more. And he talked about how the TVA is, in, it was providing incentives for businesses to go over. And at the time they were converting a very large uh, facility down in Spring Hill, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the uh, name of it. But anyway, it was about a 500,000 square foot facility to all LED lights. The TVA was paying for something ridiculous, like 45% of the project. Uh, mm-hmm. It was like a half a million dollar project to begin with, with a ton of profit. And, oh, he was telling, I'm, I'm like, what do you stand to make? He's like, it's probably going to be a $280,000 profit. I'm like, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. What? Are you, I, how do I get into this? So it kind of stopped from there. Um, I went back to work and doing my thing. Uh, I wanted to get out of the business. It was just getting too much. Even though I built myself a brand and I was the guy that people came to see, I just got tired of the car business after a while and the, the hijinks that the dealership would pull on us. It was just getting ridiculous. So I got out. I, weirdly enough, got into a, a similar business to my father's and I did that for a while. Um, I met with my present business partner again a week before my being let go from that company. And he was about to do something completely different uh, that had nothing to do with LED lighting. And we talked a little bit about that and, you know, hey, it was good to catch up with you. And then uh, I, I, one week I was doing really great with this particular company and I came in the the week after, hey, we're letting you go. What? what? Oh my God. (laughs) What? During that time that I was with that company, I was really hammering down and ramping up my side hustles again that I let go during the car business season of my life. All my voiceover clients, my video clients, I started really ramping that back up aggressively. Thank God. (laughs) Yeah. So this was the second time in three years that I was let go for, hey, it's not you, it's us. We just don't see a fit here. Not yeah. because of anything you're doing. You're doing great. We just don't, we just know you're not, your heart's not into this, you know, kind of thing. We're just going to cut you loose. So, and here's your last paycheck. So uh, my wife and I had committed to a Disney trip that we're coming up to bring the uh, kids to the first time in Disney world. Um, there are a lot of different things that she, you know, has started planning that and all of a sudden was now going to be considerably put on hold. <clears throat> and on my drive home, Angela, I was just, I'm like, you know, I'm tired of this. The last time I went through this, I, I could have done my side hustle. I could have gone full bore into it, but something told me I needed to go what I went through, what I went through. Mm -hmm. And totally this this particular time, it was different. I said, I came home and I said, Courtney, um, I'm done working for other people. I'm tired of it. And I want to do this full time. I know I can do it. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. And one of the things that Grant Cardone talks about is commit. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, what about Disney? I said, come hell or high water, Disney is happening. We're gonna, we're, it's going to happen. I'm going to make it happen. We're going to find a way and we're going to live life on our terms. If we want to go away somewhere, <clears throat> we don't have to ask anybody. We can take the time off. We're going to do life on our terms. Well, shouldn't you be looking for a job? And I said, what for? 
What exactly. <laughs> Why? So I can get another $50,000 a year job where somebody else tells me when I, can, when I have to be there, how much I can make, uh, when to show up, when I can take a vacation. No, I'm done. It didn't work for us. I said, I, that part of my life I think is over. I said, it's time to start living in our terms. Good for I said, you. I, I think we can do this. You, I need you to get on board with me. And that's what we've been doing ever since. And one of the first calls I made the very next day was to Tim Cooper who's my present business partner in the lighting company. He's, an, he's one of the best friends I have. He's a great guy. We've been together. We've been together. At, that's <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> Do you, you celebrate know I mean? your anniversary? And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and I knew when I sat, sat down with him, you know, I started listening. I started immersing my mind in good stuff, listening to Cardone, listening to Vaynerchuk, listening to a lot of different guys out there that had podcasts talking about the realities of entrepreneurship and I knew about these realities. I grew up with them. And I told Tim, I said, I, you know, he was about to go. I said, you know, what happened to the LED thing? He goes, you like that, huh? I said, I, I think, yeah, I do. Let's do that. <laughs> and that's how it was born. Just oh, do. my gosh. We didn't, have any, we didn't have anything in place. We just started going. What are we going to call it? I don't know. McCarthy Cooper Lighting. Uh, you know, and we came. I said, you know what? I've always kind of toyed around with this idea of a big dot. And I said, why don't we just call it Big Dot Lighting? Okay. And we, were at a, at a, we went to a Damon John seminar. And after the seminar, we were sitting in the Marriott Lounge eating lunch. And I, bought, I bought the URL right then and there. That's awesome. Mm, I think I might have gone to that same one because <laughs> I don't know how many years ago that was. but 2016. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I think yeah. that I went to one of them. He was getting married or he was engaged and someone was like, you need to talk. He needs to talk with you about like weddings. I can't even remember. And so I remember going down, I went down to, it's like, the, it's so clever how they do these things. I've learned so much just by going as like a fly on the wall yeah. um, for not any other intention than other just to see like how they're doing it. But my intention was to talk about the wet, not to, for them to turn around and sell me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when I was launching a pet product. Line. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I should go. And, and I did talk with him, but he, whenever they did like their first little meeting, like he's not there. He wasn't there at any of them. I mean, eventually like after, his his lead guy or whatever he's like so what are you doing and why are you? I'm like I'm like well really I have this wedding industry like job not really job but like company <laughs> and um yeah. you know someone told me and he was like oh well you know let's talk about your pet product I'm like well I, I kind of got it like I don't really need what you guys are selling like I think it's great but I've kind of got my own connections and he's like well I mean but they were so aggressive um about yeah. like signing you up, signing you up, pay 30 or 40 grand to come to this, which I get it. I, I've been going to those things and investing and I'm like, no, I really, I got it. And he's like, well, how? I'm like, well, I've done weddings all over the world at like private islands and things like that. And like, I have made my own relation. And then after he, he's like, oh, okay. And you know, I showed him a few pictures. So I just think that he was kind of like, oh, I guess you really are here to just talk about the wedding. I'm like, yeah, kind of, but I was fat. I met a ton of great people and I was fascinated by some of the businesses, but what was really eye opening to me at that thing was the amount of people that were sitting in that room. There were probably 200 people in there mm -hmm. who did not know anything. He's like, how many of you have a blog? And I think two people raised their hand. How many of you have a business Facebook page? How many of you have this? It was all about social media, like the next four hours. And I'm like, I could have taught that class way better than him. <laughs> so I'm going to do that too. So that's what I started teaching and coaching people on like videos and social media. And, but I, I just assumed that if you have a business, you know, my God, you need a Facebook business page and you need an ads manager account and you, and you need to have analytics. And I was like an idiot thinking that everybody knew what they were doing because they don't and they still don't. And we're like, you know, into 2019, my God, that was like uh, several years ago. And people still to this day don't quite understand the value of social media. And if you have a strategy, how powerful it can be like through video and your voice. Anyway, that's a whole other tangent. Um, so you, you guys were at that David John, sorry, I'll like get back on track. <laughs> that's all right. Um, 
And so did you guys do the program though with, with them? No. Okay. We, we, we kind of looked at each other and I said, you know, and home and told my wife that I was dumped 1200 bucks on something. She'd probably have my head. And he agreed. <laughs> Uh, I said, you know, I don't think we're there yet. I haven't even gotten yeah. this thing off the ground. We got we got to shit our first diaper first. Um, yep. You know, at least get in our, and we didn't have our first project until like two or three months, four months into it. Uh, yeah. But meantime, I was doing all the things that I do in order to make an income. And I still do that to this day. Um, but here we are, you know, and I knew that. And I told him, I said, the reality of this is, this is going to take three to five years to, mm-hmm. to, really get it off the ground. Um, that's the reality. And when you tell somebody that who's in their 20s, it seems like a lifetime. Yeah. <clears throat> I turned 43 this year. I'm going to be 44 this year. Five years is a sneeze to me now. Yeah. And, but a lot of people, when you think five years, my gosh, that's a long time. That's it's really not long. though. Not it's, when you get up every day and you just, you just do your thing. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, our, our goal is to someday sell the business but we're not there yet. We got to keep on building it, building it, and building it. And we're, you know, every time we get ahead, we got to hire somebody and, and, and scale it up. So that's what we're doing. That's, where, that's the mode we're in right now, especially with now that we have an electrical side of it where we do, you know, commercial installs and service work and things of that nature, because it's like a three-legged stool at that point. Now it's going to be able to stabilize itself. So, so I'm, I'm sure for a lot of our listeners right now, like they think of, you know, in the creative industry, LED lights, you know, for special events and mm-hmm. neon lighting and things like that. But is your target market in the LED space? Is it more commercial, like large buildings? Like what is your number one target market? Because I'm sure you guys can do events and, um, you know, things where you take it up, put it down in 24 hours. But are you doing more like long-term, like we install your stuff, it's going to save you money and power right. and solar and all of that? Yeah, it's an energy cool. efficiency play for commercial, for businesses, uh, property owners, pro- property managers, facility managers, uh, apartment complexes. Uh, like I Huge. said, we just did Trevecca and they're, they're on par to, I think it was a 13-month payoff for them. Um, That's a college in Nashville, in case people yeah, aren't a big one. <laughs> Yeah, a big one. Private. Yeah, we had we had them pinned at three hundred and eighty five thousand dollars a year savings. With That's amazing. Over that LED. Yeah, and it, yep. and and it's a much brighter campus now. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't, I don't. It, it's funny because you asked me earlier before we started recording. You know, do you have your island yet? And while I thought, you know, that was my end game, it's just funny how things happen. And when you talk about things, how things really can become a reality, like it's not that far off. And a lot of people are like, oh, that dumb blonde, like whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. But what happened was, um, which this will tie back into lighting and LED and building and efficiency and solar power and all that. So I started working on islands, private islands, and I did Kelly Pickler's wedding eight years ago, almost to the month, because we were texting like happy anniversary. And I was actually on the island on their anniversary, doing a photo shoot with them and and doing video and content creation for social media for the next quarter. And so I started working with these private islands and actually doing a lot of luxury weddings and learned the hard way on like, people think it's so amazing and it's so luxurious and blah, blah, blah. And it it looks that way. It really does. But on the back end, as a logistical type A person, my God, the way I had to think ahead, and if it didn't get on the barge 60 days before the wedding, it wasn't going to make it unless I carried it with me. And so my resources in pulling off what I just, you know, <laughs> shit, we ran out of fishing line, go to Hobby Lobby, call Amazon, or there's a, an app now, TaskRabbit. It's like, if we're too busy in 30 minutes, we, it, that doesn't exist on these islands. And people don't, that are being served don't think about that logistically. And so I started to learn a lot. And in fact, there was an island in Australia that was for sale it, in US dollars. Like it wasn't even the island that cost that much. It was about developing the island and it had a little bit of power. It had like a private runway on it. And I started looking into it and I'm like, my God, the money isn't even in the island. The money is like in the development of it. And we, I started to become a big geek in solar power. And so I started to work with two investors and 
kind of building the plans around it. And then other opportunities came up to do other things. And after I saw like just how much, um, not fighting, but trying to change the mindset of getting people to understand Uh, like, I don't know, again, this was years ago, technology's come a long way. I wasn't up for it. I wasn't passionate about it anymore. I knew that I'd already worked on a bunch of private islands. At this point, I was consulting with them on how to psychologically close clients for luxury weddings. And it's kind of like, been there, done that next. So I kind of just, not that it was a dream. And then it's crazy. It's like, you hear, I hear people, entrepreneurs, especially all the time. It's like, we get really excited about something and then you do it. And then it's like, oh, it's not what I thought it was going to be. And so then I'm like, okay, next, you know, next opportunity. And so I kind of, I'm like, you know what? I don't need to own a private island. I actually need to help others run it more efficiently so they understand profitability and they understand customer service. So, um, you know, a few years ago, we launched a company that specifically, I mean, that's what I do. I travel and I consult. I go three or four times a year, but a lot of it's done through Zoom and through technology and helping these luxury resorts really understand the power of social media strategy and content management and like you do with podcasts, like, you know, I coach them on how to understand return on investment. And it's crazy to me, these agencies that are charging 10, 20 grand a month on a retainer and they own all the content, not the client, not the brand. It's crazy to me. And I'm like, okay, they're kind of onto something. It's a little dishonest in my opinion, but the brands that I do help, it's all through word of mouth because I've done a wedding with them. And then we, so it just, it's turned into like a great relationship, but more importantly, like opportunities constantly present themselves. And there is an old building in Nashville that was up for sale um, a couple years ago. It was a kitchen like uh, oven type company, commercial company or building. And um, th- th- some investors were going to buy it, knock it down, build condos. And the owner found out about it and he's like, nope. I'm not, I don't want to knock it down. It's kind of historical on Charlotte. It's Charlotte used to be a really bad part of town, but it's not a bad part of town anymore. It's up and coming. Um, and so <laughs> he has dumped, invested millions of dollars into it. And so it's turning into a big community space and bringing a ton of restaurants and a ton of retail and cycle bar and juice bar and so I'm uh, working on ha- the left side of the building will be a co-working space that is focused on women. So it's a little bit more beautiful from a design perspective and a psychology perspective, of course, because I'm involved. <laughs> yeah. And um, every co-working space in Nashville, it's like great views, great this, great that, no offense, but like they're highly dominated by males and um, they're just not pretty. And so... Um, I'm working with another girl on it. And then the other side of the building is going to be an event space where we will host educational things. And then downstairs, we're building out a soundproof room for podcasting and video um, where we can train people on a few apps where I'm collaborating with the creators and teaching people how to do that and creating content on their own for their own brand. And so in learning all of this and learning about the LED lighting and the solar power lighting and how much money it saves and the energy and the government, and there's so many benefits. And, but it's like such a different, it's like I lived in a wedding bubble for so long. And now it's like, like we were meeting with the designers the other day doing all the floor plan and the stamping with construction and the ladies like giving us ideas. And I just looked at her and I'm like, Oh, I don't need your ideas. Like I know what it needs to look like. Like I design stuff every weekend and spaces all over the freaking world. That's not, we don't need your help with that. And she's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, we build homes and take them down in 24 hours. I know this is more of like a space that is going to be, you know, long-term we'll probably get new furniture every year because I get bored really easily. (laughs) Um, but, and she's like, but it needs to be logistically functional for an office for every day. I'm like, no, actually it's, this is the complete opposite. Like, I don't want, we don't want a sterile office environment. Like we want it to be like walking into several beautiful living rooms and 
build community. So I've just learned a lot on that side and the benefits of it. Like it's huge right now. It's huge. Like with the whole LED light stuff and how much you can, even in your home. Oh my God. Like the light bulbs from Amazon that are connected to my phone app, (laughs) you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, that light bulb's fifty dollars, but it's an LED and it's motion, and then it's hooked up to the all the cameras and just the technology is so amazing. Um, and you can make a really good living off of it, you know. So, and, it, and it's funny because uh, you know you're so right. You can't go into a Home Depot or Lowe's and not find eight aisles worth of LED products. Now that's yeah. where the world is going. The technology, the wave is here. Uh, and it's funny, I've, I've been pretty good at overcoming a lot of objections uh, in the car business and in various industries, and including the LED uh, lighting business. Um, and there was one where it was, it was an objection where it was, it, it was really interesting and at the same time stupefying because the guy came out with it and I almost wanted to smack him. And he goes, uh, he's, I just don't see it. But okay, I understand. What don't you see? What 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 about it doesn't make sense? I I just don't believe in LED. What? What? <laughs> what don't you believe in the existence of it? Or <laughs> I, I just don't believe it'll save us money. It's basic physics. When you take a thirty-two watt volt bulb and convert it to a ten watt, it uses less energy. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to save something it's a pretty big savings but you know it's yeah that was that was that was an interesting conversation i was like you know i I can't help you if you don't believe in it so well and now the thing that is so like really neat about everything about what you're doing is like over the last year branding is a cool thing Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of saturation around it but you bring like life experience and all these backgrounds to not only teaching people on coaching them on having the podcast and the intro and the outro, but actually you have all this other experience from car and from radio and that like people can't read that in a book and know how to do it. And so to put that and then put that into other people and help is just so cool. So for somebody who wants to have a podcast and do you have any tips for them on explaining, because again, this is another idiot moment of mine. I'm like, don't you have a 30 second elevator pitch, like an intro and an outro and people are just going to look at me. I'm like, you need that for everything, not just a podcast. If you're doing mm-hmm. videos, like you need to have a CTA and they're like, huh? I'm like a call to action. Mm-hmm. And so if someone is, when you're putting together and there is, you know, I'm sure a psychological formula behind it and someone's trying to do an intro and an outro, is there some tip that you can give them on what they need to cover in an intro and an outro? In an intro and outro, uh, mainly on the intro, you know, the outro is more of a call to action. Hey, subscribe to here. Here's where you can reach us, ask questions. When people listen to the end of a podcast, you know, if they've gotten all the way through it, uh, you should at least be setting that up. It should restate the image of the broadcast, the style, the feel. But the intro is to set the tone in any show. Uh, instead of coming out cold or something like that, um, it sets the name of the show, a general idea of what the show is about, and then, you know, kicks into a, a talk over bed, much like a radio show, uh, to set the tone, to get the enter the forward momentum going. That's the whole idea behind it is to make it sound better to make it, I, I call it making it sound like a major market radio show because that's what podcasts are. They're all, mm-hmm. they're just, they're just another iteration of radio, which everybody, pretty much everybody has always been intrigued by radio. They always thought it'd be, that's a cool job. <laughs> and now everybody can do it. The problem is everybody can do it. So that's where you have to be good. You gotta be entertaining. You know, that's, that's the big, uh, you, it, it's one thing to be informative. And it's funny, we just talked about this last night in my previous episode, informative and value posturing. You got to be entertaining first and foremost. Gary V can say everything he does without making a dent if it wasn't entertaining. It's him. He's got that magic bullet DNA that makes it all come together just wonderfully because he doesn't give a crap how he comes across. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's the authenticity of it. Um, if you're going to be somebody out there to put, and I know a lot of people that do this, 
that put themselves out there and they're faking it till they make it and they're trying to not being themselves. They're trying to be somebody else. People are going to pick up on, like the, on it in, in an instant. Yep. That you know? don't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I do my podcast for fun. I make sure that, and I tell people all the time, if people listen, awesome. I have, a, I have a fun time doing it. I do it because I always thought talk radio was fun. I worked in talk radio. I never had my own show, but I never really pursued it. But now I have my own show. And yeah. if you listen, awesome. If not, okay. It is what it is. I'm going to get better. And if you're going to do a podcast, one thing I will leave with you is listen to every one of your episodes. Listen back to them and be your, your, your worst critic. Air <laughs> check yourself. That's <clears throat> great. That's awesome. It's important. It is. It is. It's how you get better. <clears throat> That's awesome. So. Well, if anybody wants to start a podcast and they need coaching, help, all of that with content creation and marketing the podcast and all the media coaching, what's the best way for them to reach out to you and get in touch with you? Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com or Instagram at Jim McCarthy VOS or not dot com at Jim McCarthy voice VOs. <laughs> <laughs> Try that again, Jim Talking Take Two. <laughs> Jim McCarthy V O S. Victor Oscar Sam is my handle on Instagram. <clears throat> I love it. And Thank that's you. that's probably our biggest platform right now where we are growing <laughs> Instagram and IGTV. And it's funny, it's like the most people are on Facebook, but our engagement rate is higher on Instagram and then on Pinterest, you know, for our industry, because it's so visual driven, we have a lot of interaction on there as well too. So is Instagram your big thing right now where you feel like that's where it's, it's at? Yeah. It's a great way to meet new people and connect with people and use hashtags and find the people who are, you know, doing the things that you're doing. I'm actually looking at, I'm stalking your Instagram profile right now and I'm, <laughs> it's funny because you got this checkerboard thing going on. I'm like, that's I do. really cool. How I do, do I do that? I do. I, so one of the girls on my team who's green in true colors, um, she, which I talk about true colors a lot on this podcast, all psychology, um, but she's all about strategy and numbers and engagement. And so last year when we were really going to focus on building organic reach and I'm not all about paying for followers and all that. I'm like, I want real people who I can help and mm. not fake people who are robots. And so, um, she's like, so this year she's like, let's pick a theme. And I'm like, Oh, what? I'm like, just post some pictures. And she's like, no, no. She's like, I want to have a theme. She's like, what are your top three things that you want to focus on next year? Which is like a loaded question. And I'm like, well, I really, you know, want to help others, inspire others in the creative community, help with business and making sure that people are like doing their passion, but also being productive so that, you know, you don't work all the time, but you love what you do. Like you're excited to get out of bed every day. Like we started the podcast and, um, so she like the, my team got together and came up with a few little ideas and I'm like, I love it y'all. Like, let's do it. And they're like, okay, so here's what we need you to do. I'm like, oh dear God. So it's like, I'll go and do my part and then they, you know, help and do their part. So it's very much a team effort to, um, stay on brand and make sure that we're following like what we need to do. And then, um, it's hard for me just to like, ha you know, do the same thing. So that's where I just kind of on my stories, I'm like, whatever I'm doing that day. <laughs> um, and my team's like, at least they disappear because sometimes like you're just not on brand and you cuss and blah, blah, blah. And I guess I've been banned a few times from Facebook for, I mean, I don't mean to, but it's like that's just <laughs> kind of part of my life. It's like what I grew up around. So anyway. Um, okay. So I hope that everyone got lots of, lots and lots and lots of great stuff. Um, loved all the car stuff and the car tips and the LED tips. And one more question, because a couple of my friends have changed like their home all over into LED efficiency. Do you know any statistics in terms of the cost savings that like a 3,000 square foot house, if you went from, you know, like the norm to like all LED, do you know what like cost savings was? Or like even in, in your office, like if you change over, what that could do for a, a company? Like a small, a small business, not like these, not, not, not a Trebekah. <laughs> right. For a, for a residential type of situation, 
Yes. And you're looking at, it's going to be minimal, you know, because you're not burning the bulbs all day. You know, you got an exterior light that's coming in to help you facilitate, you know, the illumination of whatever you're doing. Um, maybe during the winter months, you probably would save because you're using your lighting more. But okay. in an office situation, the lights are on all the time. That are the biggest cost savings come in. I mean, the benefit, the benefits go way beyond just the cost savings and the maintenance savings. And that's another thing for the uh, residential side is that you're not changing your bulbs as often. They tend to last longer, five, six, seven years, depending on the quality of the bulb you get. I mean, you know, the Home Depot and the Lowe's, uh, if you get the cheapy ones, they're probably not going to last as long. If you pay a couple dollars extra, you're probably going to get a better brand that's better built, has a better chip in it, has a better driver and all those things. But in a commercial sense, let's take, a, for example, a call center. And there's you know, 80 people in cubicles making phone calls all day. Uh, one of the projects we did, that one in Spring Hill, I was telling you about the uh, Northfield Conference Center, it used to be the, the old Saturn headquarters. Um, they've got a call center in there, and they changed all the lights out to LEDs. Not only did it save them money, it's typically about 35 to 40 percent of your bill because it's about how much of your bill is allotted. Well, about 70 percent of your bill is allotted to lighting, so mm-hmm. it's about that percentage um, typically without the utility coming in and jacking up your rate because you went below a certain demand rate, but that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah. Other non-utility benefits, cost benefits that have to do with LEDs are the fact of how they make you feel. Mm -hmm. Um, They've noticed an uptick in this particular call center of about two to 3% because people just felt better. Um, they had more energy. There wasn't any, when you're sitting under a fluorescent bulb, there's a flicker that goes mm-hmm. on. And we call it mental fatigue that actually, you know, they noticed that two o'clock, three o'clock lull of lethargic performance decreased and if not went away altogether over time because the LEDs just didn't do that to people. It didn't beat on them, you know. Yeah. Um, in, in, a, in a car dealership, for example, I position it like this. Okay, let's say... We take all of your lights out of your service department, replace them with brighter, healthier option like LED. What if you get an extra RO, repair order per tech out of them every day? How much would you have to crack that whip to get them to turn another repair order? Mm -hmm. But now that they don't have to go get a flashlight, they don't have to get uh, another kind of light off the wall and plug it in and take all that time, they just naturally see better because of the brighter light. And it makes them feel better. It makes them work harder. That's what would you have to spend to crack that whip to get that kind of productivity out of them? Why don't we just change your lights and you automatically get it? Wow. You know, do the math on 30 techs. If, even if you get 10 of them that churn an extra RO per day, yeah. you're telling me that's not worth it? <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with you? Right. So what is, what's, if, if anybody's interested in lighting, like from a commercial standpoint, what is the website for that? Big.lighting.com. Got it big.lighting.com. Awesome. I'm going to check it out. But for podcast and intro, outro, content, media, marketing, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com, right? Correct. Correct. Awesome. All right. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much. (laughs) I I could just talk to you forever. Um, Thank you so much for all of your time and your insight and your wisdom and everything that you shared with our audience today. And I hope that everybody has a great day. Be sure to tune in next week to Weddings Unveiled so you don't miss any of the juicy details that we're talking about. Have a great day. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list, and if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.